Creations. It is I, Quillfeather. It has been a very, very long time since we have streamed this game, but I wanted to get back to it. Um, so let's proceed with part five of Eric's story from the time of our last rest without any further ado. Okay, so we have a few choices here. We have D'Angelo. Uh, it says, this one says, Strange Bedfellows. It says, as you leave your haven, a homeless man bumps into you. You turn after him, but he blends into the crowd before you can even get a good look at his face. Instinctively, you check your pocket. A note. Looking at Manhattan Bridge, come over. D. So that's D'Angelo. We have Hope, the Malkavian, her master's voice, Kara wants to meet, Hope decides you should see her alone with the case of your sleeve. Okay, I think I have a pretty good idea of where we were at. Uh, this is a reporter that was bothering Sophie. Uh, somebody watching me, I remember that one from one of our previous playthroughs. And this guy... Let's proceed with Hope's story. I think that's what I want to do here. Let's proceed with Hope. When you reach the cafe, you're welcomed by the familiar face of the waiter who first led you inside. You exchange looks and nods. He hides his bait pen in a back pocket. She's been expecting you. Something happened to her car and she, uh, it hasn't exactly left her room ever since. He scratches his head, shrugs, and gestures at you to follow him. It's the same route as before. First, beyond the locked door at the end of the room with all the computers, then into an endless gray labyrinth. Finally, you reach a door that would look like any other to a random bystander. Of course, by now, you know that Hope's Haven lies beyond it. The waiter bids you adieu with an exaggerated bow, and starts walking back to the cafe. You enter the familiar room. This time, the lights are on inside. Hope is inside, walking around nervously, overseeing every screen in sight. When she spots you, she wastes no time on introductions. Kara Montgomery, what do you know of her? I know the name, not a lot, heard something, no, not a lot, no, you could have seen her in listicles such as Top 5 Badass Women in Tech 2018, 12 CEOs to spark innovation through empathy, or 20 entrepreneurs with mysterious ties to Jeffrey Epstein. You don't get to voice your answer. The question was just a minor courtesy. She has a monologue to, to deliver, and she won't allow any interruption. Twenty years ago, she was a failed dot-com investor. Now she's CEO of Double Spiral, a brand management startup working at the crossroads of big data and influencer culture. The quotation marks are audible, dripping with venom. Long story short, she spent years convincing our Camarilla contacts, as in out-of-touch old farts angry about smartphones, that Kindred can benefit from controlling the internet. Her IT ghouls have done a lot of research on deep fakes, AI, and machine learning. Her goal is the ability to generate thousands of believably human online accounts. Basically an army of posters that could brute force anything into the mainstream discourse. The elders took a while to get the concept, but eventually, Kara got their blessing. The thing is, she claims her tech is ready to be tested, but it needs one final component to work properly. That's why, she pauses. She proposed a truce. Good news. What truce? Fuck her. Let's see. Probably a 
ask what truce, I think. Truce? What kind of truce? The become my friend or face a violent death kind of truce. Not exactly fucking convincing, if you ask me. But no matter how much I hate her guts, this is a blessing in disguise. Hear me out. She picked a public place in Manhattan, neutral ground where we could meet without the fear that the other party might do something stupid and violate the masquerade. She wants to just talk. You will go there in my place and listen to her terms. We won't accept them, of course, especially not after she just tried to kill us. You will just steal her voice and walk away. Steal her voice? You? I'm going alone? Why don't we, won't we accept the truce? I'll choose the steal her voice option. Steal her voice? What's next? Will you trade her mermaid tail for legs? A Disney joke? Sweet. What next? Will you hit me with the topical Harry Potter reference? I'm not trying to be obtuse here. Wait a second and let me explain my plan. You see, there is only one way to even the odds. We have to hit Kara where it hurts. And she's only got one weak point. Double Spiral Headquarters. Kara's the only person there with access to every room. The security is something she came up with herself. Voice-based, but using a different password phrase every time. That means just recording her talking is not enough if we want to get in. That's why I started selling illicit materials to people with access to advanced deepfake audio technology. I've got it right in this room, and now all I need is a sample base that will allow me to manufacture... Yeah, excuse me. You've got it... Yeah, wow, I can't talk. Apologies. <clears throat> I've got it right in this room, and now all I need is a sample base that will allow me to manufacture a bot that talks like her. To monitor data, I need to stay behind. Still, I think the plan is pretty simple. You talk to her while wearing wear- Wow, I am sorry guys, I can't talk. <clears throat> Still, I think the plan is pretty simple. You talk to her while wearing a wire. I process the recordings here to steal her voice, and voila, she's wide open. Then, we invade Double Spiral and destroy it from within. The evil is defeated. I become part of your crew. Happy ending for everybody. How does that sound to you? Will I be in danger? Will she even talk to me? Sounds fun. Well, let's go with sounds fun. He's a bruja, that's something he would say, I think. Sounds fun. Happy to hear it. Hope shakes her head and claps her hands. When she speaks up, she sounds different. More spaced out. Stuttering. Alright, let me fix you up with the hardware. She hands you a minuscule earpiece and starts attaching a small decorative pin to your clothes, along with some masked wiring. It's a directional microphone. I can clean up the audio later, but keep it pointed directly at Kara as much as possible, alright? You put on the earpiece she gave you. It fits snugly deep inside your right ear. One, two, one, two, one, two, one, two. The hardware works flawlessly, and the audio quality seems great. You give Hope an affirmative sign with your hand. Oh, God. Head, not hand. You give hope an affirmative sign with your head. Beautiful. Card designated the meeting place as the Vessel. You've heard about the place, right? It's right by the eastern end of the Lincoln Tunnel. A giant pile of staircases, basically impossible to miss. Manhattan's answer to the Eiffel Tower, or a gaudy monument to being only ever so slightly free, depending on what, who you ask. I'd drive you there, but my car is still in the shop, and I don't want to risk being spotted by Kara's people. And I need to process the voice data from here. Which means I have a perfectly acceptable number of excuses for not letting myself get anywhere close to that demonic old hag. You involuntarily roll your eyes a bit. Hope sits in front of her screens, pretending not to have noticed. 
So should we get the show on the road or what? Ready whenever you are. No sense lingering here. You get back to the street and find your car. Wrapping up this show as quickly as possible sounds like a good idea. Around 30 minutes later, you are in front of the vessel. Pope's description, a giant pile of staircases, wasn't particularly helpful. From the distance, the building looks more like a giant honeycomb, designed to swarm with tourist bees. At least during the day, that is. At the moment, the place is closed to the general public. A few men who look vaguely threatening and out of place are making sure nobody unwanted gets in. However, you have no problem getting up the stairs. All it takes is an exchange of knowing glances with one of the guards. You are expected. A lone figure appears in your sight, staring down the streets of Manhattan. You know, city people often complain about being unable to see the starry skies, but I always thought the real tragedy was how they're unable to appreciate the man-made sea of lights that surrounds them. You can teach people a lot of things, but you can't teach them to see, huh? You recognize the face from Hope's phone. Finally, you meet Cara Montgomery in the flesh. She turns to you, puts on a wide smile, and shakes your hand with a firm grip. First, a representative of Sophie Langley, now a representative of Hope? Not the way I'd develop my own career, but I gotta say, not many neonates get around the way you do. Oh, we have a new vocab word. I don't... I haven't been opening the vocab tab up very much, but let's take a look. So, a neonate, for those of you unfamiliar with Vampire the Masquerade, is a young kindred, recently embraced, but more than a fledgling. Specifically, it's a cam it's a Camarilla position, technically. For more information, look at the World of Darkness's uh, Camarilla materials. Hardy fucking horror. Hope speaks up in your ear for the first time, seething with contempt. Although the car couldn't possibly have heard her, she immediately goes on to address her absence. Can't say I expected her to actually arrive here, with you or instead of you. On the other hand, I'm sure every single word I say will be instantly relayed to her. And for the first time in forever, your empty blabbering will serve an actually useful cause. So let me make sure we cut out everyone but the middleman for a while, okay? She takes out her phone and taps a touchscreen. In a few seconds, the barely perceived. Oh god, I am sorry guys, I can't talk today. <clears throat> she takes out her phone and taps the touchscreen. In a few seconds, the barely perceptible buzzing sound in your ear disappears completely. You can't hear Hope anymore. It's probably she can't hear your voice right now either, which would mean she must be busy raging and cursing out everything in, in her sight at the moment. This obviously wasn't something she expected to happen. Could it be that Kara saw through your plan? You have to play it cool and see what happens next. Knowing Hope, you've probably heard whatever scraps can be googled about me and a pile of insults for good measure. Obviously, I know everything there is to be known about you as well, Eric. I don't believe we have a need for formal introductions. But first off, let me apologize for the discomfort my former employee has caused you. I wasn't remotely aware of his planned actions against Hope. I fully condemn them. I'm glad to see you're unharmed, and of course applaud your swift disposal of the psycho. Langley chose you well. Brief silence. So let me cut to the chase here and present myself the best way I know how, through my ideas. Who do you think has a monopoly on reality? Not much for small talk, is she? Who do you think has a monopoly on reality? Corporations. We do. The state. Corporations, we do, or the state. I'll go with corporations. Corporations do. That's a fairly typical answer, very 21st century sounding. Have they succeeded in replacing the state here, though? 
She signals to Sawai all lame. Sloppy work, if you ask me. Now imagine this. A 17-year-old K-pop fan from Ohio writing an entire thread about how her relatives in La Paz are actually glad the president is gone. A film reviewer with a side interest in politics selling you a CIA-approved narrative about Evo Morales. An approachable fitness guy explaining the situation to you in simple terms, just like it is. Animated voice, expressive gestures, and steady eye contact. She's taught herself how to project a good image, but it isn't a natural yet, but isn't a natural yet. At times, it feels as if she is screaming at you to trust her. It's not hard to emulate the masses. Reach out to one of those Eastern European troll farms and bang! A few hours later, you have a clone army that will instantly voice their support for any cause. You will spread your message, but you won't foster a new culture that serves your goals won't masquerade your messaging as independent thought. For that, you need personalities, not the masses. But the ability to emulate personalities? A whole different ballgame. Not a craft, but an art. You need to understand your fabrication so deeply that you start to hate it, and then learn to love it. And if you want to make a bunch of those personalities follow one agenda? You need a once-in-a-lifetime team to achieve that. A like-minded cl artist collective, both ambitious and obedient. Even though you can't hear Hope's voice in your ear right now, you could swear you hear her in Kara's speech. It's the exact same tone she was using when monologuing in the car. One of them must have been a big influence on another. Or perhaps they used to be in a position where they both shaped each other's personas? Hard to say. Only one thing is for sure. And that is, Hope must be absolutely furious right now. It's possible that Kara knew about... Oh, wow, well, excuse me. <clears throat> is it possible that Kara knew about her plot? Fingers crossed she doesn't. The state is satisfied when an account that went unused for five years suddenly starts yelling imperialist propaganda into the void. The aging corporations are too set in their ways. But imagine a fresh startup that enables the proliferation of ideas adjacent to the, to the prince's plans for the future. Now imagine it getting into bed with the biggest corporations and agencies. So many unlives that could be improved, or even saved, from the raids of First Light. I have the infrastructure. I have the Elder's support. All I need now is a mastermind at the center of it all. The mastermind. You mean... Uh, I think he'd be onto it, for sure. Hope. Yes, hope. She looks down and takes in the scenery below for a while. Then she points at her t-shirt, the one piece of clothing that clashes with the rest of her outfit. You know, I'm a huge fan of punk. The leading idea of my company, Double Spiral, is to make everything I do a little bit punk. I'm all about clashing ideas. I'm all about disruption. You, you blink a few times in a quick succession. Oh god, you think to yourself, she's that kind of person. You saw a lot of them in your old life. Another establishment asshole co-opting everything anti-establishment. Blasting Fugazi while ru ruining lives via Excel spreadsheets. You might have punched a boss cut from the same cl cloth once. You collect yourself and escape from memory lane. Kara started talking about hope, so you better listen. To me... Hope is as punk as it gets, a free spirit, fiercely independent, an eternal contrarian at odds with everything and everyone, developing her talents just because she finds it joyful. Not putting her talents to better use, rotting away, posting insane bullshit all the time? What a waste. I have built an environment specifically to develop her talents and let her become indispensable to our society, but she rejects it because of some idiotic hang-ups. I don't expect you to change your mind about me just because I keep yapping and yapping. 
I hope you'll keep my perspective in mind and serve as the voice of reason Hope really needs right now. Now that I've had my say, how about we put our girl back on? She taps on her phone again. A quiet buzz reappears in your right ear. smiles devilishly while Hope releases a demonic, guttural growl through your headphones. Yeah, sure, let her know her hunch was right on the money. Why the hell not? She's not happy with you, but the important part is she's with you. Don't worry, she should have heard everything. I just wanted to spare you an annoying commentary track while I introduce myself. Excuse me for a second. One of Kara's guards approaches to show her something on his phone. Hope uses the distraction to get you up to speed with how things are on her side. Yeah, for a second there, I was about to rage that the hag had gotten the better of us, but hey, go figure, she just wanted to take a piss in my Cheerios. The plan worked. I have a lot of data from my monologuing and uh, some private sources. The more we gather, the better. This display here says some more K letters could be useful. So, uh, don't beat yourself up about it if you fail, but if you get her to repeat something with K in it, that might improve our deep fake voice. Looks like Kara is done talking to the guard. Sorry about that. Looks like I've got to attend to some meeting with the Google's representative shortly. With the Google representative shortly. Oh, sports. Not bragging, though. By the way, does anyone but Hope know about this little rendezvous? Your patron? Any other companion? Or maybe the Nosferatu? Patron, Nosferatu... Nobody. Nobody. It's just us. Should I have told anyone? Maybe. Maybe not. It just says a lot about your personality, that's all. Anyway, no offense. But since Hope's not here, I really have to rush. Honestly, I feel a little insulted that she has set up this meeting and didn't even bother to show up. Insulted and suspicious, her tone of voice betrays her. She might have some good instincts. Too bad she didn't trust them here. <laughs> Sorry guys, that's my cat, Raven. You're, you're very cute, but I'm, I'm streaming right now, kitty. Still, out of respect for Langley, I decided to have this talk with you, to explain to you why I am an asset to the Camarilla, and to explain why the Elders need hope by my side. What the worm-brained hag here forgot to mention is that the Elders don't give a shit about me. Even if you don't see it my way now, I believe I've sown some seeds here that might sprout in the near future. Double Spiral looks out for people who look out for it, is all I'm saying. But before I leave, you know, there's one thing I really wish I knew. Back when I knew her, she was a different person, or different people, depending on how you look at it. Why does she fight against me so much? What's her motivation to resist so much? What's her motivation? Good question. She's never shared it with you. Answer whatever you want, but A, you better lie through your teeth, B, get her to say V a few times if you can. It might improve a few shortcomings of our deepfake software. What's your answer? Survival. Survival. Car snorts. Spare me. If she just wanted to keep pulling through, she'd have a much better chance by my side. Pride or spite would be far more believable as an answer. Should have told me you either don't know or don't trust me. Survival. V times two. Good attempt, at least. One of Car's people erupts with a theatrical cough. Car gestures at him to calm down. I really need to go now. 
see you around, Eric. She begins to walk down the stairs, surrounded by her guards. When she's gone from before your eyes, Hope decides to summarize your mission. For the love of Christ, but you could have kept her droning on for a little longer. Turns out the T letter could use some improvements as well. Not complaining though, you did good, and don't worry, the data I have should be more than enough to generate a convincing deep fake. I just need to put in some more work. So I guess I will get to that right away. Enjoy the rest of your night. Drop my hardware at your haven when you get a chance. I'll let you know when we're ready to hit Kara's base of operations. Pray for my success, sweetie, and I might be done soon. Maybe even tomorrow. And once we're done with her, we'll talk about how I can repay your generosity. Amen. The connection drops. It looks like that's all for now. You gaze at the sea of light surrounding you for the last time, and then start making your way back to street level. All right, well, that was the first half of the night. Now then, who do we talk to next? Let's see. Let's figure out who our stalker is. That sounds fun. Recently, you feel your feelings of someone keeps tailing you. Time to confirm your suspicions. Someone is following you around. Has been for a few nights, maybe longer. That can't be a good thing. The only question is, what to do about it? From the stalker to appear, tell Sophia a problem. And I think Eric would provoke them. You venture out into the street with the goal of letting your stalker know you're aware of being followed. It's time to stop this ridiculous charade. It's raining outside, and as you step onto the street in front of your haven, you wonder whether that'll help you. Will you be able to see the footprints of your stalker and puddles on the ground? Not sure where to start, you slip a few bills to a homeless man and chat up the guy who runs the local bodega. Both of them talk your ear off about strange characters hanging around, but none of their stories seem right to you. Walking the streets, you're convinced by turns that everyone you see is an enemy agent out to get you, and that your stalker has decided to take the night off. Frustrated after a couple of hours of useless searching, you cross the road without looking where you're going. A courier on a motorbike zooms toward you and has no time to break or swerve as you suddenly step in front of him. For a split second, your eyes meet those of the man on the bike, and you both know you'll collide. You'll get hurt. Something hits you, pushing you forward. You tumble, flying to the sidewalk as the courier zooms past. You feel a weight on your back, catch a glimpse of something, a person, a female, you think, and then disappears. You could spend a couple more hours trying to find the woman who's been stalking you, but in your shriveled, undead heart, you know it to be futile. She's gone. Well, that was certainly interesting, wasn't it? Alright, so I suppose now we proceed to the next evening. Kidir al Asmai, the sheriff of New York City, is knocking at the door to your haven. The sight comes as more than a little shocking. If he had business with you, you'd either expect to see him already inside, or never see him coming at all. Yet there he is, on the other side of the peephole, patiently and politely waiting for you to let him in. You carefully unlock the door and face him in silence. Evening. May I come in? You simply stare at him. Your lack of an answer doesn't confuse him, and your lack of resistance as he starts walking inside has obviously been interpreted as a permission. Once inside, he starts looking around as you cautiously stay by the door. He's really had time, haven't really had time to make this place your own yet, have you? Feels like Langley's apartment through and through. A secluded study where nobody studies anything. Look at the books on the shelf. Obviously meant to impress guests, not to be read. They reveal nothing about their owner aside from the aching desire to be taken seriously as an intellectual. 
He picks one of them up and smirks before putting it away. The phenomenology of spirit next to all this garbage poetry. We can make a bet. If she's read more than 20 pages, I owe you $50 and a gallon of blood. The kind of place that self-professed hermits tune themselves into suffer. Considering how much you have to run around these nights, you probably only use it to shelter from the sun and rest, right? Even though he's obviously making an effort to come off as non-threatening, it's impossible to forget the first impression he made. You still see him as a fierce predator, trying hard not to expose his true colors. You sense a familiar fight-or-flight response as you struggle to find a diplomatic answer to his last question. If Kadir is bothered by your silence, he doesn't let it show. He keeps walking around, toying with whatever catches his eye. Eventually, he speaks up again. Watch any baseball lately? If I had to guess, you strike me as a Red Sox fan. Now he's inviting you to talk in a more direct manner. You attempt to overcome your physical reaction to him and reply as casually as you can. <laughs> All the options are the same. That's funny. Okay. Your mind keeps going back to that night when everything was changed forever. Waking up in hell with a body next to you. Spending a night in that underground sweat box. Not sure what will happen next. That endless car ride. Three strikes. A bloodthirsty crowd. That blade. A rebirth. A baptism by fire. A frightening executor who made sure the flame scarred your spirit. As you look into his face, you realize he's read the emotions from yours. Not in the mood to exchange pleasantries. There's no animosity in his voice. He's just stating a fact. Let me get straight to the point, then. He momentarily stops caring about his surroundings, turning all of his attention to you, and demanding the entirety of your attention in return. You see, there's something I've realized over the years. In large part, I may have been hired just to look menacing with a sword. But my job is all about seeing through bonds and relationships. Camarilla would be safe as long as its members as he adhered to certain social contracts, making their dealings and affinities plain for everyone to see. But that, obviously, remains a pipe dream. This is a community of born conspirators, overly ambitious gangsters and politicians, monsters in denial, all sorts of tragically broken individuals. They are driven by desires that make them incompatible with the masquerade, incompatible with prolonged survival of the Camarilla, incompatible with the methods I use to operate. And so, I am doomed to be like a cop, constantly insulted behind my back, maybe for a good reason, but immediately called for help whenever someone loses their tableware. Or like an Agatha Christie protagonist, outwardly assisted by everyone, but constantly lied to about everyone's pasts and motivations, even if my failure to solve the mystery might be the end of us all. He tries to sound like he's peacefully resigned to his fate, but it's easy to detect a tinge of regret in his voice. A voice belonging to someone who once had bigger ambitions than this. What broke him? So you see, for this detective, the why done it is far more important than the who done it, or how done it. When you understand all the players and their mutual obligations, you easily understand every crime. But of course, the kindred know it, so they devise ways to make my job much harder. Just like conspiracies between two unrelated actors that depend on scratching each other's backs for mutual security. Or they enforce a blood bond to make someone unexpected their thrall. A boss serving their employee, a rebel serving a tyrant. Just because one is regularly being forced to drink another's blood. Little definition here, I'll show this to you guys. So a blood bond is a mystically enforced relationship between a vampire and another mortal or kindred. Drinking the blood of a vampire directly from the vein three times creates an intense loyalty in the drinker resembling infatuation or obsession, 
The bond loses its grip with time, but is reinforced by repeated drinks from the donor vampire. So there you have it. That's what a blood bond is in Vampire the Masquerade. What has Sophie seen in you? What does the prince keep at? Uh, why does the prince keep asking me about your actions? How come you're being pushed to build your own coterie so fast? You are surrounded by unclear motivations which you yourself don't understand. That unnerves me, and it should unnerve you as well. Kadir notices the effort and smiles softly. So you haven't gone mute since the last time I saw you. Good. Well, I'm here for a selfish reason. I need to develop a rapport with you to better fulfill my obligations. The last time we met, I couldn't see you as my equal. Now that you've been accepted into the Camarilla, what choice do I have? I'd understand if you didn't want to see my face again, but I'm one of the faces of New York's of the New York City community, and as long as you're a part of it, it's going to be impossible to avoid me. Especially when I have business with you, and I do. As you might have guessed by now, one of my tasks is uncovering and understanding your bonds, and one of them might endanger our community. Well, that's not menacing at all. Who is he talking about? Sophie's, my coterie, and Kaiser. You mean someone I'm trying to rec recruit into my coterie? Kadir shakes his head. I'm monitoring them, and they know it. If they're breaking the rules, they're doing it the right way, meaning I haven't learned about it yet. Unless you might want to share something? A moment of awkward silence. Joking. Mostly. He produces a file from underneath his coat and passes it to you. This is our troublemaker. You open the file and see some printed photos. You freeze up as you recognize the face and are overwhelmed by a flood of repressed memories. <laughs> Jessica. Jessica Lowell. The woman who made the last few years of your life heaven in the last few weeks, a living hell. Since she took pretty much everyone you knew with her after the split, you thought the transition to this life would be painless. No baggage at all. Have you thought wrong? You look up at Kadir, expecting answers. There are some unfortunate rumors that you committed suicide after a messy breakup. So apparently, Miss Jessica here is desperately mobilizing everyone she knows to look for you. Turns out she's contacted a lot of people who might recognize you, including some in law enforcement agencies. The risk of endangering us is relatively low, but far from non-existent. Which means she must be stopped. Must be stopped sounds threatening. You dread thinking what he's planning. I'll arrange for you two to meet tomorrow night so that you can straighten up the situation. Yeah, excuse me. So that you can straighten the situation out and say goodbye to the life you've forsaken. He'll arrange. What? Your eyes must look like saucers right now. Usually these matters are left to my discretion, and I can't think of an easier solution. The lost sheep reappears, takes care of unfinished business, and disappears. Never to be seen again. Nobody cares. It's simple. It's clean. No contrived schemes, no unnecessary victims. And it gives me an opportunity to learn more about you as I observe. When neonates interact with kind they used to hold dear, their true natures are laid bare for everyone to see. Of course, he's invested in being kind to you. Or he's making clear his self-serving intentions so that you don't start figuring them out yourself. Any objections? Any alternatives are probably worse. You shake your head. Very well. I'll arrange a meeting and drive you there tomorrow. Better come up with a load of bull that's easy to swallow. He disappears from the apartment, 
leaving you as confused as the last time he closed the door on you. God damn it. We need to think it through. For a long time, you just sit in your haven, lost in your thoughts, remembering how you once thought your world had ended with her leaving. Whining, sure, but it seems like it was... Yeah, wow, I can't, I can't read words. Whining, sure, but it seems like it was prescient whining. Alright, we have half of another night. It looks like we've got the next step in Hope's story. So I think we'll go that route. Hope's poorly scribbled message reaches you in your haven. Within an unmarked envelope, you find a barely legible address you're supposed to reach at the hour you're and the hour you're expected to arrive there. This is it then, the night of the final showdown. You check the clock. There's way more than enough time to come comfortable yeah, to comfortably reach your destination. But you decide to take a drive earlier, just in case. The ride is uneventful. It becomes more and more tense as it goes on. The gravity of the situation starts getting to you. You're about to set out on an operation against a key New York City figure, well connected with both human and vampire leads. What if her security overwhelms you? How will the council react to your raid? You can only trust that Hope has thought it all through. She doesn't seem like the type who'd attempt a suicidal mission which isn't something you typically say about a person who regularly inflicts violence on herself in front of the camera. When you arrive at your destination, you find yourself in control of the spiral logo on it. This must be Montgomery's headquarters, then. You look around the street and notice an obnoxiously lavender Mazda car parked nearby. Even though you've never seen it before, you might have an idea of who it belongs to. You park your own car at a distance from the double spiral building and approach the Mazda. A familiar figure is behind the wheel, holding a smartphone in her hand. You knock on the window. She opens the window without turning her eyes from the device. Wow, you're early. She's hiding, writing. Good evening. Good evening. Yes, good evening. Well, pity for a glorious death. She lets dead silence linger in the air for ten seconds. And she stops typing, diverts her eyes from the screen, and gives you a melancholic stare, and winks. Psych. God damn it. Come on, what's with that face? I suffer from too much FOMO on to let myself die. Got accounts to run, notifications to check. There's no way in hell I'd allow Montgomery the satisfaction of a draw. We're going in there to secure a flawless victory. No time to wait. Let's go. She gets out of the car and motions you to walk with her. Anywho, glad you managed to make sense of my ugly scribbles. I totally forgot how exhausting it is to write stuff by hand. Still, not, ex uh, not as exhausting as having to deliver messages personally to someone's door. Next time you meet Langley, Ask her to get you a, uh, flip phone or something, okay? You reach the front of the building. We're about to burn the shithole down to the ground. That's the plan. Should profile. With Kara inside, I feel like that's an important question to ask. Burn it down with Kara still in it? No, she's out at the moment trying to sell services she won't be able to offer. You see, our job is easy. We need to get in, destroy the server containing all the double spiral research, and walk out. No spectacle, no dramatic showdowns. Now, I know exactly what you're going to say. But wait, Hope. If this data is so priceless, shouldn't she have external backups? Is Kara a complete dunce? Excellent question, my neonate friend. The answer is yes, she's a dunce. But aside from her numerous negative qualities, she also has a positive one. She's totally paranoid. She used to be a naive dumbass who wouldn't even cover up her laptop camera, but she lost trust in all external companies after a little cyber espionage incident. She's obsessed with not uploading her precious data anywhere online. Now she only has one 
possible backup, hidden deep, deeper inside the hidden universe. Nobody has an idea of where it might be, but I do. Normally, I'd never be able to reach the place. Double spiral is like enough. she won't ever get the chance to succeed. So, without further ado, shall we? Hope starts marching toward the revolving door. You close your eyes, making an effort to sharpen your senses, and follow the Malkavian into the lobby of the Double Spiral building. There's a sole security guard at the entrance. He raises his voice to ask about your business, but is stopped short by Hope's commanding voice. No need. We're expected. The man looks lost and disoriented. Try again. You give Hope a nervous look. She bites her lip and presses the button again. Hyperial. Tap, 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 tap. Hyperial. Access granted. The door slowly open. You notice your companion is wearing a sour expression. Looks like the tech isn't quite perfect. At least the passwords seem randomized so we can try and brute force our way in, unless the system locks us out after a few failed attempts. She shakes her head and turns to you, her lips attempting to approximate a sincere smile. Well, we can only hope that the data you've collected is enough. To the beast small we go. She marches into the room, and you walk in right after her. The door is locked behind you with a loud thud. It's a wide open office. 
It would be as murky as the corridor you just left if it wasn't for rows of monitors illuminating the space. A shadowy figure stares at every screen in the room. Kara's voice plays from Hope's speaker. Behold, this is where the magic happens. A family of driven folks hungry for success, always taking the, bully by the, horn, the bull by the horns, building a high-tech performance culture together. None of the figures raise their heads. They're too busy programming, organizing spreadsheets, and typing in endless strings of text. Are you all deaf? Shh. Or what's wrong with them? What's wrong with them? What's wrong with these guys? Don't worry, they're likely just a bunch of ghouls and whatnot. Hardworking, conditioned, tireless, low maintenance, kinda dumb. Perfect workers. Probably won't leave their seats unless we make them, but let's not. We've got more important things to do like destroying a few years worth of their work. The figures don't stop pounding away on their keyboards. In fact, they don't react to her words at all. Alrighty, so, we, so do we go straight to the server room or do you want to check one of the side rooms first? Your call. I'd prefer to wrap things up here as fast as possible, but hey, Volkara well, is here with us thanks to the data you've gathered. You betcha. If you think you can use her voice for something useful, hey, feel free to do it. You look around and think how to respond. Uh, let's just move. That's kind of what I'm thinking. Nah, this is your show. Let's just get out of here as fast as we can. I hear you. This way. You follow Hope out of the room. Another depressing corridor reeks of who knows what. You expect Hope to walk to the very end again, but this time, she stops halfway and starts mumbling under her breath. Wait, was it this door, or don't tell me she moved things around? It looks like she's been here before. Not a surprise in itself, but she gives off an impression of a person who used to know the entire layout of the building very well. After brief, refle after brief reflection, Hope approaches a door a few feet away and pushes the button next to it. Apocalypse. That's cheery. Apocalypse. Access granted. You walk inside. At first glance, this office looks very similar to the last one you entered. Rows of screens and rows of listless silhouettes in front of them. However, Hope quickly spots a difference. Target confirmed. Moving to data room. There's a room with endless machines at the back of the open space. Hope walks in, takes out some hardware out of a bag she's carrying, and begins the process of removing the data. Should have invested in SSDs, sis. Time to bust out my portable degosser. She turns to you. This will take a good minute. I've got a few other tricks up my sleeve. If you find something that interests you, let me know. Should you wait near her or take a look around? Mm, I'm gonna say stay put. I'd rather stay here. Who knows what might happen? Viruses, degaussed hard drives, some plain old boring vandalism. Oh, you don't expect anything breathtaking to happen here. You don't, and it doesn't. You spend most of the following 30 minutes gazing at the dead-eyed ghoul in his screen next to you. Hope is nearly done with her digital mischief, an error message appears on the ghoul's screen. He tries to fight it for a while, but it's futile, so he just slumps down, resigned. A while passes. Finally, you hear a triumphant yell. All done, baby. Looks like those boys are finally going to get a break. You realize that the constant silent rhythm of the mechanical keyboards has stopped. The workers are all idling, slumped over their desks, completely resigned to the fact that their raison d'etre has disappeared. Hope hurriedly collects the, her hardware and motions you to follow after her. Alright, we're almost done. Now we just need to take care of the backups and we can get the hell away from here. You take a last glance at the ghouls and follow her steps. Yet another corridor, hardly discernible from the previous ones. This is a giant underground complex. As Montgomery spent on it. Hope looks around, frowning, 
mumbling something indecipherable. Eventually, she points in front of her. There. This is where she must keep the backups. It's a sturdy metal door unlike any other in this building. Right next to it, however, is a voice-based security system you know pretty well by now. Please, 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 just no last second surprises. She hesitates to do it, but eventually, she pushes the button. Eternal return. Look, dude, it types down eternal return. Eternal return. Access denied. Please try again. Oh, pisses her breath. This time, you push the button. Double spiral. Tap, tap, tap. Double spiral. I feel like time is frozen. For whatever reason, it takes longer than usual for the speaker to deliver the verdict. Access granted. The metal doors are loudly as they invite you in. This time, you walk in first and hope follows. Wait a minute. You recognize this place. It shouldn't be here, but there's no two ways about it. This is Hope's Haven. Same bed, same decorations, same ambience. It's a lot more dusty, but... Backups are in the back. I'll just get them. She seems a little sheepish as she approaches the double spiral devices and unpacks her own hardware to take care of them. You take in your surroundings. CEO of Double Spiral, and I endorse wrecking my shit. Clara grimaces, own voice and quiet, quickly connects the dots. You fucking, fucking gremlin! How did you get your hands on that kind of tech? Even I. Yeah. 
one. And if you have it instead of Diablery, okay guys, this is an important term, so I'm going to show you this one for sure too. Okay, so Diablery, the consumption of another kindred's blood to the point of, victim's final, of the victim's final death, vampires may not only lower their generation permanently through this abhorrent practice, but also incorporate the target's very nature and spirit into themselves. In vampire society and vampire the masquerade, it's a big no-no. Just so you know. The last time something like this happened to me, I was ready to die. I think I'll take the chance this time. It's not like I have any other life that I've been inside for a long, long time. So, finds out its final death for Kara runs, moves herself like a beast more than human, immediately closing the distance to hope. Then she jumps in the volcano and like a wild animal hunting her prey. Hope instinctively attempts to defend herself, but is immediately overwhelmed. Laying on the ground, she looks like a deer in the headlights. Kara, on the other hand, looks like a bear ready to fall its victim. If you want to react, to the limit and let your powers take over. The world slows down, letting you run up to Kara and hope in the blink of an eye. You immediately grab Montgomery by her clothes and attempt to yank her aside. However, the moment she recognizes your touch, she immediately attempts to swat you down. Despite your superhuman speed, she's still almost as quick as you. Her limbs keep zooming wildly toward your vital areas. You dodge every one of them, but each time feels like now they jump off the way of an oncoming truck. Try something different before she gets lucky and hits you. Let your instincts take over. Fuck. It's gonna be a do or die scenario, I can tell. No, instincts. We're going with instincts. You've decided to let your instincts take over. Before you know it, you're already at a full sprint. You run up to Kara, grab her, and start pulling her away from hope. However, you're dealing with a beast here. Choose to trust your instinct, you underestimate hers. Before you realize what's happened, you find yourself smashed against the nearest wall. Confused and in pain, you check your torso. Some bones feel broken. You still got lucky and should be able to move around, but this will take some time to heal. Kara's already focused on attacking Hope again. Just rushing in blindly won't help. You need a plan. Wait. There's no point in just rushing in blindly. Kara's like a feral animal right now. We use tools to overwhelm them. Grab Bob's bag. Think any of her devices help? No, no way in hell. Think harder. You look at the bed, the pillows, the canopy, the hooks hanging down from the ceiling. Bingo. Grab one of the hooks and yank the chain. It's long enough for your idea to work. You run up to Kara, who's about to maul Hope like a wild animal. Then you stab her with all your strength. The hook gets deep under her skin. Kara yells, but there's more surprise than pain in her voice. You quickly wrap the chain around her a few times, then you step back and start pulling it with all your strength. Kara is taken by surprise. Still not understanding what's going on, she loses her balance and gives her victim a chance to escape. Hope takes it. Still dazed, she takes a second to understand the situation. But when she does, she runs up to you and starts pulling the chain with you. Ah! displays surprising strength while pulling the chain. A minute later, she's hanging above the floor like a butcher's carcass. The end of the hook is stuck in her chest, and it's sinking deeper as she struggles. However, she's flailing so wildly she might free herself before it pulls out of her, puts her out of commission. Ah! You use one hand to desperately, desperately search for something that can help you under the bed. Belts. 
handcuffs, a whip, a giant cattle prod. You have no time to act musically. You put it to her head and turn it on. Ah! The device must be modified. The power current is so powerful it causes scarring almost immediately. She's getting weaker and weaker. Ah! It takes Kara a while to accept defeat, but eventually she does. Her body seemingly lifeless, her head hanging down. She looks like a grotesque portrait of defeat. The hook must have reached her heart. It takes Hope a long time to collect herself. Eventually, she manages to speak up. Guess we've gotten up to this point, huh? Just like Kara before, Hope starts to talk in a completely different way than she usually does. You have a bad feeling about this. You want to add my data to yours? You know, I can grant your wish, except not the way you, you've imagined it. Hope starts mumbling and circling Kara. For the first time since you've met her, she acts like she doesn't have a phone in her hand. This violent aura. The Malkavian looks deeply into her eyes. She knows you know what she's tempted to do. You silently beg her for her not to do it. It doesn't feel right. She makes her decision. She smiles pitifully. It feels purposefully vague. Be my witness. I haven't harmed her. You left her here with me. guys uh my voice is shot from all the reading so i think we're going to end the stream here for today thank you so much for watching and i will see you all next time um just a quick update for you all before i go though um i'm having trouble with internet connectivity on my computer right now so it's going to be a while before i probably upload anything that isn't a video game stream so, um, when that changes, you will definitely see some more non-game related content, um, but until then, expect one or two game streams a week. Uh, next time, we will be playing Stray, so I look forward to seeing you all then. Have a good night.